Good morning. Wow. Good morning. Good morning. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20. Okay, and then we'll be looking at verse 6. Well, we're, we're not going to remain there, but uh, this is just to introduce our subject this morning. Okay, Proverbs 20, verse 6. It says, uh, Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man... Who can find? Faithful man who can find. All right, so we're going to be introducing the subject of faithfulness and commitment. And uh, this is going to be the first of technically what will be a five part series. I'll be teaching four, and then we'll have Brother Frank Finney whenever they come through here that's going to be teaching within the third week. So, about two weeks from now, he's going to be covering this. So, uh, faithfulness, or just the subject of being faithful in Scripture and uh, commitment or obligation that we have. Right, the term itself is found 19 times in the Old Testament, and it's from the word uh, emunah. It's not actually found in the New Testament as far as in that form, faithfulness, but you do have the word faithful or faithfully, uh, which we'll see. Now, faithful is found 82 times in 78 verses between the Old and the New Testaments, uh, and it's primarily from the Hebrew word as far as in the Old Testament that you find uh, aman, which is the faithful to support to confirm, which also has a kind of a later, or not a later, but a um, like a weaker uh, form of being translated as, as far as being trustworthy, but is, is primarily meaning as far as like to support and to confirm. And then it's in your New Testament would be the Greek word pistuo or pistos, and that's basically faithful or faith. That's also the, the root word for faith, which is basically meaning trusty, faithful, believing. Um, now the significance of it is that it is an outstanding character of the attribute of God. In other words, this is something that is crucial or fundamental to who God is, is how we find um, not just faithful, he's also, obviously we know that he's loving and that he's holy, uh, and we can go through a number, but faithful or faithful, that God is faithful is something that we see throughout the scripture. Um, and that is something that is an attribute that is outstanding among, well, he has countless, <laughs> numerous uh, outstanding characteristics about his character. Now, why is that something that is significant to us? Obviously, we're believers, and then it's kind of, okay, that that's a good thing that God is faithful, that he's also obviously faithful to us, but we're, one, called to be Christ-like. And so if we're called to be like Christ, if we're uh, not only predestined to be conforming to the image of Christ, that attribute of him, of being uh, faithful, is something that we should obviously allow ourselves to be developed in or that we should obviously be proactive in developing. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Actually, go just a few verses back into uh, towards the end of chapter three, um, starting at verse eighteen. It said, let, man, "Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Uh, therefore, let no man glory in men." For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. 
and then he's going to merge here. He says, okay, let a man, beginning of verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So the context here in which he brings this up is the fact that he's arguing with them or presenting an argument, the fact that they're nothing more than just stewards. So account of them as stewards. Uh, the issue that among the many that they were having at Corinth was the fact that they were lifting up men and then they were separating themselves. There was a division among themselves because they said, okay, some are of Paul, other of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and then others even would say, okay, I'm of Christ. And so there was division among them. They weren't unified in spirit. They weren't unified in measure. And then they were looking to lift up men rather than lift up the God of the man that was being used by God. And so he spends chapter 1, chapter 2, and through chapter 3 um, arguing the fact that, listen, we're just uh, vessels that are used of God, some water, uh, some plant, but God gives the increase. And so when he goes into chapter 4, he said, let, let, uh, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So in other words, don't think of us any more than what we are, which is we're ministers or we're stewards. We're servants of Christ. And then he mentions this, it seems almost as in passing, but is this a crucial thing, is that it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Okay, so the context, as a steward, as somebody that is a servant of God, um, faithfulness is something that is necessary, that is crucial, that is paramount, that is fundamental. Uh, and not just because we're serving God, not just because we're serving Christ, but as that steward, period. Um, but it's necessary. Now, why would that be the case? Uh, it seems like a silly question, but why would that be the case? That it would be necessary. We want to be like Christ. Uh, yeah. Faithful. Well, we're called to be like Christ. Okay, so we're called to be conformed to His image. He's faithful, therefore I should be faithful. Uh, two, the fact is that if I am not, then there's going to be damage or harm done to the cause. There's going to be damage and harm done to the people who I am stewarding, or of either whom I'm a steward, or of whom I'm a steward to. So in other words, um, I will hurt people, and I will hurt the Lord. Uh, I will hurt his cause if I'm not faithful. Um, in Proverbs, we're told that um, there's a broken tooth or a foot out of the joint. Confidence in an unfaithful man in the time of trouble is as a broken tooth or as a foot out of joint. In other words, that's something that's painful. Okay, so you can't be confided upon, you can't be trusted upon, you can't be somebody that could be relied upon to go ahead and not only just bring a message or be able to perform as you should uh, if you're not faithful. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Wait, no, okay, hold on. I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, well, no, yeah, go Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Verse, starting at verse 19. Verse 19, okay. having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And then let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Okay. So, context here is you have the warning. You have the writer of the book of Hebrews that is writing to the believers that are scattered abroad, but they're primarily Jewish believers. I don't know. We are in Hebrews chapter 10 right now. Um, and the issue is that 
they were wanting to turn back and they were falling back into uh, Judaism, which at this point wasn't really necessary because Christ was the fulfillment of it. So in other words, they were going back to the sacrificial system that they were uh, commanded under under the law, which was looking forward and painting a picture of what Christ was to do. Uh, but Christ has already come. He was offered and then he rose again from the dead three days later. And so now someone that would um, still look to the sacrificial system is really, it's as, 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 they, as he terms it, as the writer terms it, is weak and beggarly element. That they look, that they look back to. So his argument was that Christ is better than, and then you see chapter one, chapter two. He's Christ is better than the angels uh, that some would worship. Christ is better than Moses. Christ is better than the Levitical priesthood system. Christ is better than Joshua. Christ is better than, uh, and he goes so on and so forth throughout the book here, uh, as far as why Christ is better. Um, and that is because he's, he's a fulfillment. He's, he's what they look forward to. And because they were turning back, um, they were allowing some things. There were some things that were taking place as a result of that. One, it was their influence was being dulled and being able to reach others. And God wasn't really going to be able to use them. He addresses also in chapter 5 and going into chapter 6 the fact that he says that they were dull. Um, in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 11, he says, Of whom we have many things to say. This is when he was talking about Melchizedek. Uh, and, and of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing that ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use uh, have their exercises, their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so the challenge going into chapter 6 is that they're supposed to move forward, go beyond these first principles, um, and so grow beyond just what they have in their foundation. Uh, so that's great, they have a foundation, but they're supposed to grow beyond that. They're supposed to grow in grace, as the way Peter puts it. Um, so God expects growth, and God expects that for the time that a person is saved, that there should be maturity, there should be development, and actually that there should be instruction that is got to take place. In other words, not that also that you receive instruction, or not that you don't uh, get to a point where you, you're unable to receive instruction, but rather that you're supposed to communicate that which has been communicated to you. Uh, but they, because of turning back, neglected that, and so he warns them. And that's another thing that's also mentioned in the book of Hebrews is the judgment that would come to them. Uh, not that they lose their salvation, not that they go to hell, but rather that uh, they shorten their lifespan, their, they shorten uh, basically the influence that they would have. Because um, God, at some point, is going to judge the fact that if they are not wanting to grow, which is a choice, then he's going he's to cut them off. Uh, as he says also in Matthew, that uh, he comes with a fan in his hand, he's going to flame the fire, and then those that... Also in John, that every tree that beareth not fruit... Uh, he cast it forth as a branch to be cast into the fire. Again, not, not going to hell, but rather that's judgment for not wanting to grow. Okay, so now you're asking, okay, why is this uh, significant or important here? And again, back in chapter 10, uh, he mentioned a few things. He said, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. And then also hold fast a profession of our faith. Uh, and then he likens that because he says, because he is faithful, uh, that promise. So these are areas in which we find ourselves that we are required to be faithful. Or in other words, these are necessities or that we're commanded in which to be faithful. Uh, we have not just the stewardships that we're given or that we're allotted, um, is required as uh, their man, uh, 
as regarding the stewards that man be found faithful, but also that he wants us here. He says, uh, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and then also hold fast the profession of our faith. Holding fast the profession of our faith, that would be our testimony. Okay? So that's our interaction with others. Drawing near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, all right, that is our walk with God. So we draw nigh to God and we are to hold fast the profession of our faith. And then he also says another, he has another area. Uh, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and a good works. So Though that is not specifically addressed with the terms of faith or faithfulness, in context here, um, he's commanding it because the, as we see in verse 25, um, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching, uh, it's necessary, it's a crucial element in our development and our growth, not just for us, but for those that we have influence with as far as our brothers and sisters. Uh, the discouragement that they find themselves in, the discouragement that they find uh, in having turned back because of the persecution that they experience, and even some that are even losing their life, um, is in part influenced by the fact that they're not gathering together. Okay, so in other words, they, because of refusal to gather together, refusal to really want to draw an eye to God personally, really to holding fast a profession, then what that is is that they become weak. In other words, they're not going to be a strong Christian or a faithful Christian that when they stand before God, they're going to have that said to them as far as, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right. Go to... Second Corinthians five, second Corinthians five. All right. Since faithful or faithfulness is rooted in faith, we gotta ask ourselves, I know it seems kinda I'm not trying to be insulting to anybody's intelligence. Um, almost pedantic, but we'd have to look at okay. If I'm to be faithful, and it's if it's rooted in faith, so uh, what is faith then? Okay, so honestly, the best definition for faith would have been in Hebrews 11, which we'll see next, and then also in first in Romans chapter four, towards the end of the chapter. But an element of faith that we see in Second Corinthians five. We'll start at verse 1 just to get the context for it. It says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal to heaven. For, this, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, uh, which is from heaven. I'm talking about their, their, their new body. Okay, for if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for this selfsame thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit, or the, the down payment of, of his Holy Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 7, For we walk by faith, uh, not by sight. Okay, for we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Okay, so something that's crucial here, which we're getting ready to see in Hebrews 11, is that faith is not by sight. Okay, so that's an element, and that's something that's within its definition. Okay, so if it's seen, if it's visible, then it's not really of faith. Uh, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11.
up to this point in the book of Hebrews, there's an undercurrent beyond just the fact that he's been addressing the main issue of that Jesus Christ is better than whatever weak and beggarly elements he'd have been addressing before with regard to their, their following of, uh, of Judaism. Uh, he also addresses the fact that they need to have faith and patience. We see that almost climax really basically in chapter 6 um, that they, they, they need to hold out. In other words, they need to, they need to trust God and they need to be patient. Um, and then he He's culminating now in, in this point with regard to faith because he's been addressing that uh, in chapter 10 as well, towards the end of it. And then he says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so clearest definition beyond Romans 4, which we're getting ready to see next, of what faith is. Okay, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, substance and hope are a little different than what we would term are defined in English, how we use it. Hope being something that's expected rather than something like that is desired or a wish. So the things that I'm expecting, the things that I'm anticipating uh, greatly, in other words, it's, it's a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen. It's not just something more than a mere desire or a strong uh, longing for something, but rather it's something that it's guaranteed going to happen. And so the substance or the foundation of those things that I am expecting is faith. And then he says it's the evidence. Now the evidence there is conviction. It's the same word that we would use, uh, conviction or convincement. Uh, and you see it in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, uh, that the world by the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. It's the same word. Same concept. In other words, he's convincing the convincement in my heart. So in other words, I don't see what's going to happen, but I'm convinced on the basis of a few things that this is going to happen. Uh, go to Hebrews 6. And we'll go to Romans 4. Uh, starting verse 9. Okay, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. He had just warned them of the fact that because they had not been growing, if they don't continue to grow, then God's, God's going to judge them on that. Okay, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope, or the full assurance of expectation unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Okay, so promises are made, and the way they are basically received is believing, faith, and being patient, waiting, waiting on God. Okay. Um, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained a promise. Okay, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability or the unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, okay, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation. And now he's going to basically describe Christ. Uh, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, okay, which hope we have as an anchor uh, of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into, the, uh, into that within the veil. With the forerunners uh, for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he mentions there's two things by which it was impossible for God to lie. Um, that we might have a strong consolation that everybody that, well in particular here the context is that the oath that God had given to Abraham and then also to his children, to Israel in particular, but also by extension it would be to us 
uh, as those that are uh, believers. Now, even though we are not, uh, well, I don't know if anybody here has any kind of Jewish blood into them, but as far as me being a Gentile, I'm grafted in and I'm adopted, um, but I didn't have Israel's promises to me being a Gentile. But we do have, uh, with the New Covenant, we have uh, many of God's promises, and God gives promise, and he gives so by two things, in which he says it's impossible for him to lie. Now, question, what are those two things that he gives? He gives. You mean, it's, when you say he gives, you... Oh, okay. Uh, verse 18, it says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for lie, um, in other words, there's two things concerning God or about God that whenever he gave an oath, uh, it was impossible for him to be able to lie, and they're not changeable about his character. So what were those two things that make it to where I can be consoled? In other words, like I can have confidence, I can have rest, I can have peace that when God gives a promise, uh, whether it was something looking back towards Israel or something that is specifically directed towards me, that I can say, wow, okay, this is going to happen. This is a sure thing. And I don't have to worry about uh, whatever the devil or whatever the world or whatever the lies that I'm hearing about God are uh, that I'm being uh, attacked with. That I can say, okay, this is going to take place. Maybe, maybe faithful. God is always faithful. And God does not change. Those might be two things. Yes. Uh, he can't swear any higher than himself. So what do you think of? Uh, my my notes say um, uh, the in the Bible um, um, first the pro God's promise is based on His unchanging word. Um, and this I think the second is since He can swear by none greater, He swears by Himself. It's kind of on his holy character. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so, simple term. What he says, okay, and then who he is, So, which is his ability to back up what he says. All right, so not just what he says, but actually his ability to back up what he says. In Philippians 4, we're told, well, this isn't the only place that we're told this in Peter as well, that we're told that we're to cast our burdens on him because he cares for us. Cast, or casting all your care on him, all the things that carry you. And then in Philippians also that we're told that um, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And then he, he gives promise that it, if I give him my problems, basically he's going to give me peace in exchange. Um... The idea that I would get peace, or the reason why I would have peace, is because he's got it. In other words, when I give something to him, he's got it. And here's something that I would, it would be kind of understood, but the thing is, he's got it, right? So he's almighty creator. You know, he made heaven and earth. Uh, he made me. Okay, he's given me life. He sustains all things. By him, all things consist. Uh, we read. You can go through... Uh, and, and basically, this is a record of God's interaction with humankind, with mankind. Uh, and you have at least, what, 6,000, 8,000 years worth of human history recorded uh, beyond just what we have within our lifetime of having God interacted in our life personally that we can see and look, this is what God is like. And so he doesn't lie, and he's able to actually back up what he says. Okay, how many people do you know that are like that? Not very many. I mean, there are some folks that their word is gold or solid and bond, but the fact is they're still a limited human man or woman. And so they're not able to do the things like God is able to do. And so two of the things, his word, what he says, and his ability to back up what he says, which is his character. So he... It says here, uh, as you mentioned as well, is that he's faithful. Okay, he's faithful. And so, I am to be faithful. Oh, faith is founded upon this, 
Uh, go to Hebrew, or excuse me, go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Uh, starting at verse 16. It says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Uh, addressing both the Jew and Gentile. Um, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before whom, or excuse me, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope or against expectation believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Uh, and this is speaking again of the fact that. Um, Abraham isn't just a father of those that would be of his seed, the Jews, but rather also that the Gentiles were to be grafted in. Um, okay, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed unto him uh, for righteousness. Right. We've seen in Hebrews 11, faith is a substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Um, this is what faith looks like in action. Okay, among other places, we're getting, we'll see that more as the series progresses. And that is that it doesn't waver. Um, it doesn't, as it says here in verse 20, it staggers not. Um, and in particular, he was strong in faith. And then it's fully persuaded that he would, um, that what God had promised he was able to perform. All right, so... Well, we'll look at instances of what you would call weak faith and God rebuking that. But the fact is, even though he would, you would have weak faith, he would still work. The fact is, faith is something that is a choice of the will um, and that everybody is able to, we're all commanded to be believing. Okay, When a person gets saved, um, that's how they get saved. In other words, it's by faith. Uh, we're commanded to walk by faith. On Colossians 2, verse 6, as ye have uh, received Christ, so walk ye in him, uh, rooted and grounded in love. In other words, we're supposed to, uh, that's how we grow, is by faith. And then faith uh, is not going to doubt. Okay? It's, it's, uh, it's going to work. In other words, you're, you're going to believe regardless of doubts. Um, and so faithfulness is the outworking of that. Uh, faithfulness is my character. It's my choice of the will to go ahead and believe God and to act in accord with in particular direction that he is leading or that he has taught. So some of the areas that we are called to be faithful, some of the areas that we're called to be faithful. Uh, we've seen in 1 Corinthians 4 that any and all stewardships uh, you know, as a kind of man, is, <laughs> moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Okay. Um, some of the things I have listed here: marital relationships. For those of us, well, in my case, I'm not, but those of you that are married, you know, a husband is to be faithful to his wife. Okay. And what that would be is that you would leave. And then you would cleave to your spouse, and you're not to look to any other. In other words, that your spouse is your spouse until death do you part. And same thing with the wife looks to her husband. 
uh, again, till death do you part. Any variation of that, or uh, or not variation, but any um, deviation from that, basically addressing the word of God as either fornication or adultery, in particular with the married couple, would be adultery. And then you have familiar relationships. Okay, so you have mostly you see in Paul's writings in Ephesians and Colossians uh, and Philippians is the fact that not only just with husbands and wives, but you have children in not only submission and obedience to the parents, but you have the parents' uh, commands given to the children, uh, sons to daughters, and then uh, or sons and daughters, and then uh, both parents, so the parents. You have what I would term employment, but in scripture it's called uh, masters, and then uh, those that are under subject of masters. Uh, though we don't have a uh, slavery system here in the U.S., this, it basically would constitute what would be considered employment, which is voluntary. So you give up your time and your life, basically, in exchange for money to be able to go ahead and fulfill your responsibilities. But we're supposed to be faithful in these relationships. And something else also, uh, as we've seen in Hebrews chapter 10, is to the local church. So these are the foundations of our society. In other words, this is how society operates. Uh, now, of these, the church is something that's a little significant or different to this day and age, which we didn't have before. Uh, you had a worship system of God, and anybody that wanted to come to know God would have worshipped him through that system. Uh, you see in every society leading up to uh, the coming of Christ, you have worship of what they would consider deity. Uh, but if they were to come, once he started working through Abraham and Abraham's seed, anybody who wanted to come know God would have to basically have become Jewish. And then they would have come to God uh, through, through his people Israel. Uh, once Christ had come, uh, offered himself, and then he was raised from the dead three days later, he does something a little different that he hadn't done before, and that was he had given command, we see in... Uh, I'll say Mark 16, not Mark 16. Um, <laughs> Matthew chapter 16 is that you have um, Christ say that he's going to build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, so in other words, he's going to do something a little different now. He's going he's to build his church. So now he's in the process of building it. He has given to every believer a gift that we read in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And then not only has he given to every believer a gift, he expects that gift to be utilized for the development of his church. Okay? And so our faithfulness in using that, which is a stewardship, by the way, uh, is going to affect greatly uh, his cause, which is that he, you know, his church right now this day and age, which he says of it that he loved himself and gave himself for it. Okay, so in other words, he considers it something that is a prize value. It's very high in value to him. We are called to be faithful uh, in all our stewardships, all our relationships that we are in, and if we're going to be faithful uh, we need to understand the root of that, and that is that is faith, and that is believing. In other words, and some issues, of, uh, or not some issues, but some things concerning faith is that uh, faith is not by sight. Uh, faith pleases God, and then faith is a choice of the will. So in other words, I don't... Uh, though faith is listed as a fruit of the Spirit, again, walking in the Spirit, that's a command, uh, is a choice of my will. Okay? And any command that is given in scripture is an appeal to the will. It's not something that's automatic, but it's something that I activate as I choose to say, okay, yes, God. And that's a choice that I make either to submit my will to God or if I want to keep on in rebellion, uh, go ahead and, you know, be a rebel. Uh, we're going to see in the next few weeks a few things. Uh, next week we're going to be looking at character study basically we're going to be looking at how faith 
and faithfulness outworked in not just lives of saints in the Old Testament, but also lives of saints in the New Testament, and then what we can learn from them. Um, week four, we're going to be identifying, uh, what, excuse me, we're going to be looking at the practical outworking of faithfulness. In other words, how do I do that? Okay, so we see the importance of faithfulness. We'll see how faithfulness is played out in believers' lives. And then we see, okay, how, what do I practically do to develop faithfulness? Okay, hey, I'm guilty, I've not been faithful, so what do I do? Okay, we'll, we'll repent, but we'll look at some practical steps of what we can do to be able to be faithful or develop faithfulness. And then uh, last week we're going to be looking at hindrances to faithfulness, okay, and what we can do to curb those things uh, so that we can structure our lives and organize our lives so that we would uh, be effective and, and faithful. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, if not, we're dismissed.